Good morning, Tracy. How are things for you today? Not too bad. How are you, Hart? A little busy, but you know, that's that's life, right? <laughs> I'm just ready for the holidays to start. Yep. Do you have any exciting plans or? Yeah, nope. <laughs> nope. Just relaxing. Yeah, just staying at home. That's sometimes the best. I think so. I think so. Just, I you know. How about you? Anything special? Um, I, nothing too exciting. I'm going to my girlfriend's parents' house uh, for a little while in uh, in rural Rhode Island. Oh. So it'll be Small quiet. State. Yeah. Yeah. A little colder than I'd like, but <laughs> I have to break out my old winter clothing that yep. I've used like once a year now. You're like, is this still something I can put on my self? I don't know. I I have uh, not a lot of clothes that uh, are for cold weather, so. Yeah, same. And all mine are like, oh, man, they're approaching like 15 years old. <laughs> so I went to college in the Northeast, and then I've been out in California ever since, and I've just used them so little that it's it's. I still basically have the same ones because, like, do I really want to replace them for, like, one time a year? Right, right. So, sort of a, yeah. Don't need it. Don't need it, I guess, where you live either, so. No, not typically. Although it was 37 degrees when I woke up this morning, so. Oh. Mm hmm <laughs> It got down to 41 in San Francisco this week, which is... Very surprising. Again, quite uh, uh, not normal. Since this starts recording when the first person joins the meeting, I will leave it up to you to declare when the meeting has started, Tracy. <laughs> we'll give a we'll give a few more moments. We see All people right. are still joining and we don't uh, yet seem to have a quorum from the TSC membership. I'll, I only saw one uh, regrets uh, from Jim yeah. that showed up. I don't know if uh, TSC members saw the contribution uh, campaign swag packs or uh, put in for them, but uh, if you've got an email, you should, you should be able to get a free one. Yep, mine showed up this week. Cool.
All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining the December 16th call of the TSC. Uh, as you all probably are aware, although we do have a couple of guests today, and welcome to our guest, uh, you, there are two things that you have to abide by uh, at the TSC meetings. The first one is the antitrust policy notice, which is displayed on the screen. And the second one is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. Um, so with that, we'll hit the announcements. Um, as always, uh, in the announcements, we have the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out each Friday. Uh, if you are interested in including anything in that Dev Weekly Newsletter, there is a link on the agenda to a wiki page where you can add your comments uh, for inclusion in the in the Dev Weekly newsletter. Um, so feel free to add anything that you might have about your particular project or anything that's interesting going on specifically in your community or working group or SIG, um, anything that you would like to have highlighted uh, to reach the community of Hyperledger developers. The second announcement that we have here is just a reminder that uh, next week and the following week's meetings are canceled due to the end of year holidays. Uh, we will pick up the meetings uh, the first week in January and um, obviously enjoy the, the time off, uh, enjoy the new year. And uh, that's the announcements that are listed here. Does anybody else have any announcements that they would like to make? I, I'm going to say there's one more for uh -huh. Dan Daniela has an announcement, but I see Arun raise his hand. So Arun. Hey, um, probably it's not an announcement. It's just a heads up because next couple of weeks, we are not going to have a call. If we had, then maybe a few people would have joined and updated it. So, um, so some of the uh, six and, and uh, the chapters we are planning to collaborate across and run a long running hyperledger challenge it's it's a it, it's going to be a long running challenge not exactly a hackathon we the goal is to have more open source contributions and then bring in more people uh, contributing into hyperledger and also bring in new projects into labs so that's an heads up if you have um, so more details will be shared across over an email and also it will be shared across in coming weeks and if you have any needs within your projects or if you have needs let's say within some of your SIGs that you participate please bring in those problem statements and in, in this challenge so that's the heads up thank you all right great thanks for me so another way to get uh, additional contributors to the uh your projects your SIGs your working groups uh, your labs anybody else have any announcements they'd like to make Well, Danielle hasn't unmuted, so I, oh, uh, there's there's Danielle. Go ahead. What was my announcement? Uh, well, okay, fine. Uh, Sean, who many of oh. you know from the community, has uh, joined Hyperledger as uh, as my peer, and uh, I'm excited to have him here on the team uh, working on on uh, Hyperledger. So, Danielle, or Sean, uh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Danielle, and I'm super psyched to be here. So. And to be back, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's really great to have Sean uh, join us and support Rai and David Boswell as the team continues to put new programs into place. Um, we're excited working on our planning for 2022. Um, and Sean, a big welcome, a welcome back and uh, a welcome to the staff uh, here at Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation. All right, great. Thanks uh, for that. And Sean, uh, really glad to see you again. Um, welcome to the community architecture role. Um, anybody else have any announcements they'd like to make? Okay. Uh, so with no more announcements, uh, we will head to the quarterly reports. As you can see, we have a couple of reports that are outstanding and overdue. Um, we did get in the Firefly report, um, which 
from what I could see. I uh, didn't necessarily have any questions uh, or comments that need to be addressed. Uh, we do still have, looks like about six people who haven't yet reviewed the, the uh, report. Um, so definitely if you're a TSC member, don't forget there are a number of reports that do need your uh, reviews. Uh, so if you, um, you know, would take the time to do that, that would be greatly appreciated by the projects. Are there any questions that didn't get addressed or, or added to the uh, Firefly report that needs to be addressed? Kamlesh? So in the Firefly uh, report, I think maintainer diversity is uh, only the one company now. So what is the plan of the maintainers project maintainers to, in, to increase the adoption or maybe increase the diversity of the developers? It's a good question. I don't see that we have anybody from Firefly on the call. I would recommend Kamlesh adding that question to the report um, to yeah. see if we can get some answers back. Okay. Yeah, Bobby? Hi, um, I know that um, through the Giving Chain project, we took a break um, when the mentorship prog program was over and we intend to come back um, in the new year and help. I know the mentees are definitely ready to get started again, helping the Firefly people. So I believe that they will become contributors to Firefly in January. I think the, I think the question is more around the maintainers. Um, looking at the contributor diversity report, um, that was added uh, linking to the LFX insights, I did see that there was uh, a 25% increase of contributors over the past three months. Um, but I, I do think the question around 100% Kaleido maintainers is a, is a question that we, um, you know, should, should pose to the uh, Firefly community and uh, definitely work towards increasing that uh, diversity. Well, maybe one of the mentees one day will be a maintainer is my there you goal. Go. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you start, right? Start as a contributor, work your way up. Um, okay, any other, any other questions or comments that we should make sure we're addressing to the Firefly community? Yeah, as far as that goes, Nico did share on the maintainers list this week a presentation that they put together about their community building efforts so far. And I do believe in there, he flags that finding and you know bringing new maintainers on is a challenge. So just one thought for us is what sort of guidance from, from the more mature projects, are there tips or suggestions or ideas? Like, do we have like a best practice guide for perhaps finding maintainers? That could be a thing to think about. You know, what if they're raising their hand and saying, yeah, we really want some, but it's a challenge. How do we wanna you know guide them perhaps? Sure. Does uh, anybody have any thoughts on that uh, from the perspective of how they have added maintainers to their existing projects? And Kamalash, I'm not, yeah, okay, thanks. I, was, I wasn't sure if your hand was up to answer that or if you had a uh, follow-up there. So I think, uh, actually I raised my hand. Yeah, so, right. yeah, so to increase the diversity, Maybe like suppose if you see example of the blockchain automation framework, they uh, extended the uh, their committers and uh, contributors in the very short time. Similarly, if Clyde, Clydeo and the uh, that Firefly team maybe do some POCs or maybe involve the community, talk to the SIGs or regional chapters, do some kind of workshops to get the more involvement to the project. That's a business plan from them. Okay. Anybody else have any ideas or suggestions that we can offer to projects as they want to increase their maintainer diversity? Arun? Hey, probably um, one good thing about Firefly report, at least for the last quarter, has been from the LFX insights. It's just that 3% uh, or maybe 3 uh, people have 
disengage themselves from the contributors and there is increase of 25 at, at the same time so there is some engagement from the contributors so it's not one of contributions that we are saying for outside Kaleido, but it's still a question that we need to get through them and ask them what is the time frame that they are looking for from an external engagement point of view um, for them to be considered as a maintainer. And in terms of PRs count that LFX Insight tells us, it's close to 85% of PRs that are coming in from one organization as opposed to 15% from rest of those 45% uh, people coming in from different organizations. Maybe that's another question that we can talk to them, talk through them about. Yeah, for sure. And I, I uh, recall uh, seeing on the uh, DCI mailing list, uh, Karen, you had sent out a report on uh, increasing diversity and inclusion amongst projects. And David, I think your response back uh, pulled out some of the pieces of that. And one of them was, making sure that projects document the process by which people can become not only contributors, but maintainers as well. Um, and I think that's a, a really good point and, and maybe something um, that I, I'm not aware one way or the other, whether or not Firefly has that or uh, which of our projects do have that, but that's definitely um, something that I think was a worthwhile call out um, for us to, you know, look at as a community to see about increasing diversity of both contributors and maintainers. Yeah, that's a really good point. I don't know exactly what we would do, but maybe just reviewing and understanding where that documentation exists and where it doesn't kind of maybe that mapping exercise could be a good point that could give mm -hmm. us some direction about where maybe we could provide some support to fill some areas in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else then uh, on the quarterly reports? Um, obviously, we have now four that are outstanding um, that haven't yet been uh, reported on, and then we have four that are coming up um, that we'll be uh, looking at uh, in the new year as well. So uh, just just recognizing that if you are a project. Um, maintainer or community in the community of these projects, letting them know that their reports are due um, is something that I think is important. And I know that Dano has been, um, you know, reaching out to, to these projects as well to try and get people to put their uh, reports in. So just, uh, you know, this is a lot of outstanding, I guess, quarterly reports that we have. So uh, with that, uh, we do have a, a decision on the list here for the TSE member attendance of project meetings. Um, the issue that uh, was created last week um, by heart, I did not see any additional comments added to this. Uh, so I'm going to assume that based on that, that everybody thinks that this is ready to go as is. Um, but before we call this for a vote, I'd like to uh, see if there's any discussion on this um, that maybe didn't get added into the issue that should have been added into the issue. All right, so seeing no hands, I think... Uh, you know, do we have a motion to put this to a vote? I move we vote. All right, thanks, Nathan. Do we have a second? A second. All right. I think there were a couple seconds there. Uh, I definitely heard Peter. Um, so let's go ahead and put this to a vote. Um, Rai, did you want to uh, to I, walk us through a vote? Uh, Sure, I didn't think this really needed to be a roll call vote, but um, if that's what you would like, um, Troy. Troy, in the matter before the uh, TSC, how do you vote, yay or nay? I didn't hear a vote. I don't think we need a roll call. Yeah, me either. <laughs> 
Hey, I'm, you know, the reason sorry, I'm asking, I, the, uh, sorry, the reason I'm asking for a roll call is because I'm not seeing a lot of um, engagement from the TSC. And so I want to make sure that people are uh, engaged in these conversations. So I'm going to force a roll call, guys. Okay, I, I will start. I think it on. makes sense, actually. Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, Tracy, because it does require us to actually do something here, right? It's not just, oh, you vote yes and you're done. It's like, no, you're basically committing to, you know, um, uh, basically implement that plan, so. Okay, I'm gonna start over again at the bottom, Troy. Uh, how do you vote, Troy? Sorry. Uh, it, um. I apologize, guys. I actually missed the, uh, the the topic on this one. I'm really sorry. Okay, um, you you can abstain. I mean, I'll abstain. Okay, Tracy. Yes. Peter. Yes. Nathan. Yes. Camlash. Yes. Uh, it looks like Jim is still not here. Hart. Yes. Grace. Yes. David. Yes. Dano. Yes. Bobby. Yes. Arun. Yes. Artem. Yes. Arno. Yes. Jim sent regrets. I I know. Um. And uh, Angelo is uh not here either. So we have uh, the, the motion passes with one uh, abstain. Okay. So in the new year, um, please at least one meeting uh, per month attend uh, as a TSC member. This is real work now. Yep, exactly. All right, so the, the second uh, item here is in our discussions. Uh, we do have a draft that is out there. Again, I did not see any sort of comments uh, showing up in this document this week. Uh, for these services for graduated projects versus incubated projects versus labs. Um, I, but I do want to make sure that if anybody has any comments that they would like to add, anything that they see that's missing that they would like to make sure that is uh, being provided by the Hyperledger staff that that does get into this document. And to plus one, what Tracy said, we definitely do want some feedback. I mean, if it doesn't happen to be feedback today, you know, we can always, you know, have additional discussion going forward. But, you know, our goal with documenting this information more clearly is to make sure that projects and labs have what the leaders of those projects and labs need to be successful. So, you know, that really requires input from, you know, the people involved to say, hey, this is something we do need and we don't have clarity about it, or this is great. And, you know, uh, um, but the more feedback, I think the better on, on this. So please, if you have thoughts, we'd love to hear. Yeah, Arno. Yeah, so I went through the document earlier and I have to say, I mean, I didn't see anything that shocked me. So that's the good news. Uh, uh, you know, I kind of wish that the document were built in a way. And so this brings a question to me is like, you know, I would expect levels to 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 kind of build onto one another you know what i mean is like i would imagine lab kind of is the minimum and then you say oh incubating projects have everything the labs get plus those things and the graduated projects have everything the incubating projects plus those things but you know the document wasn't built that way and i felt like well if i say that i'm gonna say well thanks but this is extra work and I wasn't ready to volunteer to do the work. So I kind of hesitated to say it, but I, it fundamentally, it also raises the question, is that actually the case? Do, do those, you know, are, are those, those levels, do they exist? Do we have this kind of like increasing level of services, which I would expect, but maybe isn't really like this. I don't know. Is there anything a graduated project gets that an incubating project doesn't or the other way around? Further. Right at the top of the list, um, the paid subscriptions here 
Um, the one that we pay the most for, the ones that we pay the most for are Artifactory and Circle CI. Those are the largest, uh, I guess those aren't CapEx drains. Um, NPM is very little money and Docker Hub is non-zero money, um, but Artifactory and Circle CI are the two uh, that we definitely gate. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I mean, I really meant the other way around. Is there anything an incubating project has that the graduated project doesn't? I, I would not expect that. So I, you know, it seems to me that it would make it easier to digest this document if it was built as, you know, uh, a, a growing list with incubating and then graduating saying, you have everything the incubating projects have plus those things so you can see exactly what the delta is that's what I mean, I that is the feedback i would want to make the project or i would want to make the documentation more digestible i guess my thought was that projects don't necessarily go through things linearly like that like you don't necessarily become a lab first then an incubation project so you know that was my thought to kind of treat them like fully document each because you may come in at that a given level not the level before right yeah, uh, I think um, I'll let Dano talk and then I'll, I have a, uh, maybe, maybe I have a comment on that as well, but Dano, I'll let you go first. Kind of to touch back to Arno's point, um, one of the reasons that I had asked for this, for the staff to put this together, just to figure out what the graduation things are, you know, what extra do you get at the next level? Um, and I think starting out this way, I mean, you just go through, you think, well, what is it that they get at this level? And it's just a, a formatting issue to try and change how we present it. You know, we could do the chart and everything. But you know, when I was looking through this and I was looking through what incentive does a project have to go to graduate it, it was, there was no centralized place to even look up this information and be sure that this is what we get. So I think this is a step towards that direction. Um, and I don't think it'll take too much to reformat it in one of those um, good, better, best plans like you, you might get from web hosting or something. So I think we'll get there. But I think the big thing that is pointed out here is there's not a huge difference between an incubating and a graduated project. So Dan, I'm gonna make sure I heard that correctly. Are you suggesting there's we, there should be more of a difference? Actually, I am, because I think there should be more of a carrot to go to graduated rather than staying indefinitely in incubation. Because the phrase incubation implies you're gonna leave, you're gonna grow, or you're not gonna be viable anymore. It, you know, the, the name incubation, I like it because it implies it's not a steady state. It's, you know, it's a transitory state like inflation. And I agree. Yeah, and I think, I, sorry, go ahead, Tracy. Go ahead. No, go ahead, David. I was going to say, I agree. And I do think there should be a, a you know, a, a substantial difference to offer that carrot. And maybe some of those differences are subtle, but I think there definitely are things that would incentivize somebody to go through there. Like maybe the way that we phrased it doesn't like highlight what those differences are enough, but I feel like there are significant differences. But again, maybe subtle. I think it's. I think the document, as it's written, as Arno um, has alluded to, is is difficult to see that, right? Um, you know, it it could be uh, the formatting that Arno recommends. It could be we put together some sort of um, you know, chart that is check, check, not checked, right? Um, it really shows you what the the true differences are. Um, if it's wording though that is making them different, uh, then that has to be somehow highlighted, I think, in, in the way that this document is put together so that people can truly see this is the, the new stuff, right? Or this is what this level provides you that the other level doesn't, right? Sure, I, uh, I agree completely. And uh, I just wanted the, the historical context that this came from, there was a much larger difference and uh, this exercise definitely showed me that there is not perhaps as much a difference uh, as there should be. So uh, it, I'm, I'm interested in feedback on how, how it is that we can, what are those services and how can we differentiate that? So this, this was a good exercise for me, even if we don't uh, end up 
uh, making huge changes because they're just the delta is not large. Yeah, and it's a good question to put to the TSC, right? Um, what do we think a graduated project should get that makes it special? Um, uh, what, in addition to to maybe the things that are being offered, um, should we think outside the box and and see about whether or not that could be something that we add to the um, to the list? So I don't know if anybody has any suggestions or has been on other sorts of projects whereby um, there's a true distinction level um, for graduated versus incubated versus labs or sandbox, whatever they might call that project in that project. But uh, you know, any sort of examples I think would be helpful to, to provide. I know I had provided one, I think uh, from the Academy Software uh, Foundation. Um, so, but if there's other people who have been in projects or uh, who have seen different ways of looking at this, I think that would be appreciated. Maybe we could mention the paid security audits that happen for projects. That hasn't uh, been as, I mean, uh, that's not as distinct as it has been. Uh, you know, we're doing an audit for Ursa, which is not graduated, right? And Cactus. And Cactus. Yeah. And even then, you don't, it's not like something that you need to do every quarter, only when you change significant things. Like base has been pretty stable. We haven't needed an audit, but. Um, we're trying to get one lined up for when we finish our merge work so that we can get uh, audited and make sure we didn't introduce any, you know, we're doing sig significant things as far as communication between two nodes and HTTPS. So that's not obviously a good security walk through there, but also architectural. But not every project changes their architecture once a year or once a quarter. So. I can highlight a couple of things that are new. And so maybe that's why it's not clear that there is a distinction here, but you know, we are starting to do these project workshops, for example, people may have seen that we're doing one starting with Aries and Indy. I think that is something that should be graduated only. You know, those are gonna be, you know, significant uh, resources to help onboard new users of the project, new contributors to the projects. And I think that should be something that is perhaps limited and I, I hopefully that would be an incentive those seem to be doing really well the Aries workshop we ha are having to close it's filled up so quickly um, I think another thing that could be worth doing although it's not clear yet is maybe relook at the Hyperledger website and maybe give graduated projects much more prominent uh, exposure there and that could be a, a difference as well but again that's not in place now so it might not seem obvious that that is something that might be a, a difference, but that, that could be part of the marketing uh, differences between those levels as well. Hart? Yeah, I just wanted to agree with David here that I think we should heavily market graduated projects more. Uh, this will substantially decrease, I think. It, it, will, it will encourage projects to graduate, and it might also substantially decrease uh, confusion in the Hyperledger space when traditionally we've just put out in the, the greenhouse graphic, all of the projects, even those in incubation, it's a lot more to process than if we just have the handful of projects, you know, say that have graduated. We have done a little bit of that. Um, if you go, well, I guess I'm driving right now. So if you go to, uh, you know, hyperledger.org, uh, we are putting, the, the graduated projects. Uh, I thought we were putting the graduated projects above the, oh, okay. <laughs> well, we did on the wiki main page. Right, but this this should have the, uh, the landscape embedded right here. Yeah, it looks like it's broken. So I look at it. Uh, yeah, but the, uh, the graduated projects would be at the top. There we go. So the graduated projects are at the top and incubated and then uh, 
below that the, the dormant project. So we are working on it a little bit, but point taken. Could there also be something there? Maybe uh, graduated projects get a bigger budget for LF mentorships so that there's more contributors coming in that way. There could be. Uh, I think over the last two mentorship cycles, I, I believe we accepted everyone that applied. Um, I believe that every project was funded because we 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 weren't limited. Um, there weren't enough applications to run a mentorship, so we had money for everyone that applied. So. Oh, okay. Well, that, that limits the options there then. Okay. But Peter, I, I I like that idea as a the priority are the graduated projects if we do have to select from many, which hopefully will be the case. So sorry, I was thinking through uh, the doc, but then I guess what Rai just said, it concerns me a bit right now, right? So, um, I mean, when I hear about Hyperledger and the kind of engagement that I hear out there in the public community, there is interest among community members to participate to attend and, and participate. So they are looking for any uh, kind of opportunity to get onboarded and in terms of contribution. And I think the point that you just spoke about, it concerns me a bit. Maybe I'll connect offline about it. I believe we should have at least received more applications, right? Right, it wasn't that we were low on applications. It was that we were low on programs for people to apply for. Got you, okay. So, so we had a budget for, I don't know how many, let's say 20 mentorships. And we only had 17 memberships that were proposed uh, by the projects. So that, that was a limitation. Or I misinterpreted it. Sorry, thanks. Arnaud? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it occurs to me that I think one of the challenges we have, you know, and, and maybe this is why, you know, and I, by the way, I agree, this was a very useful exercise to kind of try to, you know, actually put on paper, so to speak, uh, the differences, which are not that large as it's been pointed out. And, and I think that one of the reasons it maybe it, there isn't that much of a difference is because I think there is a bit of a conflict in trying to help actually the, the project that are typically in incubation, for instance, uh, and, and, and trying to put a character, as Dano said, <clears throat> for the, the graduation and, and you know, for project day and graduation. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, on the one end, it seems fair to say, hey, graduated project deserve more services. On the other end, the reality is, maybe it's the one that I incubation that need the most help, right? And I don't really know how to deal with this kind of like tension because, you know, um, yeah, I think, you know, what stops most projects from moving out of incubation, as we all know, is the lack of diversity and contribution. And so saying, well, we're going to kind of push them down on the website and other areas is kind of deserving, you know, it, it's, it's counterproductive in trying to help them get to the, you know, a broader community of contributors. So I don't know how to deal with that tension. You know, how do we make it so that graduate projects have an advantage and how do we help steal the incubation projects? Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that, Arno, because I, I was thinking something similar, right? My brain went, well, at what point do we start to discourage incubation, right? Um, because we were giving all of the, the highlight to the, the graduated projects, right? Um, you know, because you could take that to an extreme and, and really do a disservice to the, the people who are trying to build the next new thing, right? Which is what you, what you would expect to find in, in labs or in incubation. Um, and, and the next new thing is, is, I think, 
just as important as the things that we want to be stable and, and graduate it. So um, I have the same exact thought as you. And so I think there is an interesting tension and an interesting balance that we're gonna have to bring to all of this. Yep. All right, any other thoughts on this document before we move to the next topic? Just a quick one. Uh, someone mentioned uh, converting the document into a chart format, and I want to plus on that idea. What I envisioned was uh, some product landing page where they have the free tier, the pro tier, the enterprise tier, and then you have these uh, list of features that are included. And then there's always this uh, pattern of how the number of features are growing. So you want to be on the enterprise tier because that's the best. Uh, so I think that's that's something that a lot of people have seen a lot of times. And it's immediately clear that the, the best tier, the top tier is the carrot and that you should get there. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, so, Rai, David, I, I hope that's uh, been valuable uh, as far as feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Especially making it more digestible. We'll definitely play around with the format. And then maybe when that's more clear, we can discuss, do we have the balance right between how much each tier has of each? Sounds good. All right. Uh, so if we look at the next topic, um, this is a topic that I so, somewhat mentioned and threw out in last week's meeting, um, but I wanted to put it up for some sort of discussion to see in general what people are thinking. Um, specifically, uh, because we do have a number of overdue project reports, uh, I was thinking, what could we do about that, right? Um, I, again, maybe this is more a stick than it is a carrot, um, but uh, should we be moving projects to a dormant state if we haven't heard from a particular project uh, within a given amount of time uh, with their project reports? So I wanted to open that up for discussion and see if anybody had uh, thoughts on that, if it sounded like a good idea, a bad idea, or had other sorts of thoughts on how we can encourage people uh, to put together their project reports for the TSC. Right. I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of a historical context here um, in that uh, we did when Composer uh, transitioned, uh, it was, I think, a year or so after they stopped filing updates before there was any official move to to uh, transition the project. Uh, and it was I think that was hard on everybody. And so I would I would encourage the members of the TSC to uh, find a way to to enact this and you know not not make it so punitive but uh acknowledge reality so that people can understand the shape of the thing better yeah i i mean right part of the reason that the project reports were put together um was to ensure that the projects were um in some sort of healthy state right we were having a hard time as a tsc trying to understand kind of the status of projects and what was happening with those projects and and really, this is our this is our insight into each of the projects. Um, hopefully, we'll get a bit more insight now that we are going to be attending meetings to see how things are actually running. But uh, definitely a, uh, a piece. Um, the other piece that I would say is that in looking at the dormant state as we wrote it up, um, it was supposed to be at the request of the projects. Um, so this would be changing kind of the, the thinking around that as well. Dano? So, yeah, I remember when we talked about the dormant state, we discussed the possibility of involuntary dormancy, but we never, we said we'd cross that bridge when we get there. And I think we're quickly getting there um, with one of the projects on here that's now a month late. And I think a year between reports is too long to go to dormancy. Because another thing about dormancy is you can revive a project from dormancy. It's not like deprecated where you say we're done, can't use the name, stick a fork in it, you know. If a project has a legitimate reason why they've gone dormant, you know, or maybe a not so good reason, then they get their act together. They can always say, hey, we're back. We're going to do good. You know, move us back to incubation state. Um, so I think, 
you know, we should consider what thresholds on project reports is one of the triggers for involuntary. And I think if you miss a full quarter, I think we should have a vote on it. Um, the question is if they're consistently late, you know, maybe not. But I think that's, you know, to put a, a red herring out there to start the discussion at, I would suggest that a project that misses a full quarter of a report, we should, it's not forced, but we should have a vote and a discussion on involuntary dormancy. Okay, Arun? I have a couple of points. First is related to um, dormant state. Dormant state, as you said, sounds like an informed decision where project uh, team members, they come together and then they say to TSC, hey, this is the period that we are going, um, let's say quiet for a period and, and we'll probably come back. Um, maybe we need revision on to that, the, the definition and, and what we are planning under dormant state, right? So just because a project is under dormant, we cannot move it to, um, uh, right. So uh, I think my thought process were to introduce a new state, but if that's something that we can edit under the dormant state itself, that's something we should look into. The second point I wanted to bring out was maybe reports as not submitting reports is not the only reason why we should consider this. There could be other reasons that we should look into. And I would, request more additional time to think through that. Okay, yeah, definitely. I, there could be other reasons that we might want to decide that uh, a project should head towards dormant state. So, uh, you know, if there's things that people can think about, uh, this was just uh, in my face uh, as far as the overdue project report. So that, that seemed like an obvious sort of thing to, to have a discussion around, uh, right? Sure. Uh, there is uh, one more thing uh, there, which is, um, you know, GitHub also, you know, lets us mark stuff as read only or, or whatever uh, archived. Uh, so there could be, you know, that's, it would be really rude to come into a project and just archive all the repos. I'm not saying we should do that, but that is if you're looking at a project and their repos are uh, not active and not archived. Like if you've got 40 open bugs, you know, a uh, hundred unreviewed PRs, that could also be a trigger. And Dano, I see what you sent me and I will post that in the chat. Dano? Well, that was to uh, individual, I thought I was posting to all. I posted that in the, the chat. So one thing we should look at is the definition of dormant. Um, it does say there that the TSC will make the decision as to whether the project moves to dormant to or from the dormant state upon request. And it doesn't say request of who. I mean, I guess what implications to request of the project, but you know, it's, you know, the, the definition is projects in dormant are ones in which normal functions are suspended or slowed down for a period of time. And I think that the, the TSC realizing that that's the current state of the project and the current functioning, um, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's within bounds of the definition, but I'm willing to be, you know, discussed on it. Okay, Peter. I agree that anytime it happens, uh, we should vote on it and we should have context as in if they missed a report or two and now we are considering it, then we should also reach out via the normal channels, email and chat and just flat out ask them, are you dormant? And if no one is even there to respond, then it would be much easier on my conscience, for example, to vote saying, yes, that's a dormant project, let's pull the plug. But if they respond and say, oh, uh, the lead maintainer was uh, in an accident and then out of work for months, but now we're back, so please give us some more time, then I would say in the vote, I would say, well, let's give them some more time. So I think uh, they should make it part of the process to just uh, gather a little more context from the project and then vote. Yeah, definitely, um, Peter. And I, I know uh, that uh, when we started out this TSC term, uh, Dano had um, volunteered to, once a project went past its due date uh, for the project reports, reach out to that project to let them know um, that they had, um, you know, missed a reporting, if you will. And so I think 
you know, we could make the assumption and we can confirm with Dano, right, that uh, that is truly happening and that he has reached out to these projects that are overdue um, and maybe hasn't returned or received a response back from them. Nathan? Not yet for this week's, but for Bureau, they've done three pings, two by email and one by chat group. Yeah. So, Nathan? And I mean, let's acknowledge the reality of this. We would reach out to them anyway for a missed report. Most of the steps we'd have to do to determine whether they're dormant or not are the same steps we're doing just to try to hunt down the report. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's a lot of additional work. And as a TSC, we consider a project going into dormant a bit sad, like it's not something we want to have happen. And we wouldn't do it to someone else, you know, deliberately against their will or in any way maliciously. But we do want to acknowledge the reality because we realize that being an active project, it takes work. Um, and hopefully moving a project that's struggling to even submit a report is a relief. Um, we want to relieve that burden and let them focus on the things that will help their project become active as opposed to being, you know, in the middle of trying to, you know, figure out incubation requirements or, you know, uh, cater to the requests of the TSC about status when there's really not much going on. So um, uh, I think that this seems really reasonable that if you miss a whole quarterly report and no one can get a hold of you, that the TSC would ask, hey, are you guys dormant? And it's not an answer that has a predetermined conclusion. And we're not going to try to move a project to dormant that doesn't want to go to dormant. We're going to ask them, so what are you doing to be active? <laughs> And uh, I, I don't think it's anything more than just trying to acknowledge the reality to, to reduce the amount of burden on everyone that's that's trying to do a good job with their project. All right, thanks, Nathan. Hart? Um, yeah, and I guess I, I know that the sort of burrow is on everybody's mind. Um, I guess, so I, I assume Dano um, has reached out to Silas on this. Um, I'd be curious to hear what uh, Silas had to say about this. And also, sorry. I haven't heard I, back from Silas. That's the problem. Oh, OK. Yeah. And I'll say sorry about my quarterly report. This was quite the week to, to miss the email <laughs> on it. I think one or two weeks is in a crisis. I think three months is really the threshold. Yeah, yeah, I hard. This definitely wasn't uh, wasn't trying to call you out in any way, shape, or form uh, for missing this week. Uh, we no, seem to we seem to have had some missed ones uh, quite quite a bit here, and it's it's just a um, more a question of you know these long term ones um, that that are on my mind. So, all right, Hart, I don't know if your hand is still up or if you uh, want to add to. Okay. Um, Nathan. I would even say we don't mind a little bit of quarterly report rebellion as long as they're here and actively rebelling. Um, it, it's just, uh, we, we want to acknowledge the reality of if, if a project's truly dormant and no one can get a hold of someone, that's a really bad contributor experience if someone's trying to use the project or someone's trying to fix something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Dana? Rebellion is an indicator of life and that's really what we're looking for. Does that mean I get to skip the BASU quarterly report next week? <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. We're about to be for it. <laughs> nice well, try, Grace. Grace, I was well, going to ask the same thing. <laughs> you know, we're not having a meeting next week, guys. But uh, at the same time, definitely have it done for that first week of January. Um, so I don't have to call you out. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments on this particular topic? It sounds like we're, we're all fairly much in agreement. Uh, would it be worthwhile for me to uh, go ahead and write up some sort of decision log entry uh, for us to take a look at uh, when we come back in the new year? Sounds good to me. OK, I will work on that then. Um, all right, so we do still have about six minutes left. Uh, would anybody from the task force, we have two task force out there, I think Grace and Arun, um, would you like to provide an update on kind of where you're at, if, if there's anything that uh, stands out to you that might be useful for the rest of the TSC to know about? 
or I can go up first and probably make it short. So we had our first um, congregation, our, our first meeting early this week. And there was enough interest that I received through email, but however, I could not see that getting translated onto attendance on that call. However, I'm pushing hard to get more participation from all the projects as much as possible to the task force. Now, apart from uh, the participation, there were really uh, good points made out uh, and, and during the call. And thanks to all of you who contributed to those thoughts. And there have been a couple of action items noted down. Uh, the main action items are going to be around um, how do we measure uh, criticality of a particular vulnerability that gets reported, right? How do we even measure that if it is a generic bug versus something that needs attention? And what's the score on which we should decide on that? Uh, I mean, decide uh, the, the criticality. Plus, uh, there was an action item on, on coming up with um, questionnaire for deciding uh, for a particular maintainer, how do they report? Wait, let me open up the um, these sorry task force agenda item. But yeah, at, at, at a high level, uh, meeting minutes has been posted on the task force uh, wiki page. So if you have any comments on those open uh, items or maybe any of the notes items on that page, please feel free to comment and please do join our next call. That would be three weeks from now. Um, mostly in first week of Jan. All right, thanks. I did just put a link out to the Hyperledger Security Task Force on the TSC chat. Um, so definitely have a look and uh, let Arun know if you're interested or uh, can provide some insight into what your different projects are doing related to security. Grace, any update for us? Yeah, I think um, most of the group is up to date, but um, we're currently just in um, data gathering mode for the chat task force and understanding how um, the different communities within communities across Hyperledger use different chat channels. Um, our next meeting will be the first week of January. Um, the idea is to share there the kind of final um, inputs and then maybe start to put together a proposal of kind of here, maybe the, you know, two or three kind of options that we have. Um, the, what we're hoping is by the end of January to have kind of a, a recommendation and, and be able to implement, because obviously, you know, aligning on the chat channel strategy is important for facilitating our community. And we don't want to draw it out too long. Okay. Thanks, Grace. I also put a link to the community chat uh, task force out there as well. Um, so I think there's been lots of good discussions in that particular task force so far. Um, yeah, with that, I think that's our agenda, unless there's anything that anybody else would like to add. Uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> Thanks, Ry. Yes, definitely, uh, everybody enjoy the holidays and uh, have a great new year. Yep. And we will see you at the beginning of 2022. Yep. And thank you all once again for all your contributions and support of our community. So happy holidays to all and uh, have a great, hopefully everybody gets a, some rest and enjoyment with their family and friends. So happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Irene. Bye-bye. Happy holidays.